This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Today's podcast is brought to you by Leverage, a new fully featured decentralized futures exchange without compromise. Are you ready to trade the future of crypto today? Well, Leverage is a DEX, so you can trade with your keys and sign orders just with one one click and leverage is fast. Yes, indeed, leverage is powered by Gluon, a new layer two solution with the scalability and speed of a centralized exchange and the low, super low fees of a DEX. Yes, leverage the new exchange that combines the best features of CFI and DeFi so you can trade crypto spot or crypto derivatives with up to 100x leverage while maintaining control of your assets at all times. It's like William Gibson said, the future is already here, but in this case, it's evenly distributed and completely decentralized. Go to leverage.io and leverage is spelled L-E-V-E-R-J dot I-O and trade the future of crypto today. Yeah, boy! My guest today is Josh Olshewish, the lead analyst here at Brave New Coin and a crypto trader at Tikami Capital. Welcome back to the show, Josh. How are you doing? Good. It's finally stopped raining here. It's been raining for a week. Like not like not like a mist, but like a full on rainforest. It's been crazy with the rain lately. Sun is out, full moon is over, crypto's bouncing, all is good. Yes, all is good. I mean, you know, what a what a difference 24 hours makes. A bit of a cliche to say, but very true in this case, because as I was, you know, just putting down some notes yesterday and in, in preparation for talking to you, and we were sort of, you know, in the midst of this fairly deep correction. And, uh, you know, it was a little bit uh, doom and gloom all over the place, but I've, I've woken up this morning and boom, Bitcoin has bounced and we're back above 48K. Yeah, we sort of bounced. Typically when you make a new all-time high, you have a correction, then you make a new all-time high, you have a correction. The question here was whether or not we were gonna have a correction all the way down to the previous all-time high, like Ethereum did. So Ethereum basically broke the previous all-time high on the low side, which was like 1460. We, so 1460 consolidated for a couple of weeks, and then it broke up, um, then it broke down back below 1460. Now it's above 1460, but for BTC, uh, it didn't quite reach 41, 42. It recovered at around uh, 44, 45, depending on the exchange. So just looking at it, e, uh, ETH looks less bullish than BTC, and that's, excuse me, basically how I've been trading it. ETH, ETH had a lot of issue with fees and just, general nonsense that you tend to see at any price expansion. You just get more people in the market and the weaknesses of the, the coin just are, are very apparent very quickly. In this case, it was fees and scalability. So um, that slowed everything down considerably at the highs because it costs, or it was costing like $500 to transact or something on ETH. Um, so if your transaction fees are like a fourth of the total cost of the coin, you know, it's going to, it's going to hurt a lot of people who are trying to use that coin. So hopefully they can get some sort of scaling measures figured out. Yeah, well, that's right. Because, and, and as a subsequent, uh, well, the effects of this, of course, have been to the gain of, uh, well, two chains in particular, the Binance Smart Chain and Cardano, of course. Yeah, I mean those it's it's easy to say like ETH's weakness is someone else's strength when it may have just been part of the rotation in general of sure people you know selling highs in ETH and buying lows in, in Cardano or BSC or BNB. The people who are in those communities will exploit these price differentials and say, look at our look at us on this side of the fence, we're so much better than ETH, right? But the truth is very few of those chains have any actual, you know, transactions behind them 
probably Binance has the most, um, but um, Vitalik talks about this all the time or used to, that there's this trilemma where it's scaling security and centralization. So BSC is basically completely centralized by Binance. Um, and so they're able to do things differently than, than Ethereum. Ethereum is attempting to be sent decentralized. Um, so they just have different governance parameters that they they have to work with. Um, and then Cardano is still like in this river of sticks limbo of being sort of decentralized, but actually not really decentralized. So I don't know, it's, it's all over the place, you know, as far as what we're looking at here. And then there's Sam at FTX who's just pumping out as much stuff as physically humanly possible, which good for him. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think most of it is rotation game. Most of it is like people getting fed up with ETH fees and just going elsewhere in the yes. moment. I don't, I don't think that's lasting though. I think the ETH network effects are a little too great at this point. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, I want, I want to come, come back to, to Bitcoin because you did say that uh, Bitcoin was, you know, it's, it's, it's Bitcoin that uh, leads the market and Bitcoin is looking more bullish than ETH, you said. Uh, but just before we do that, Josh, I, I do just want to uh, make a an audio note, if you like, to the listeners uh, that, you know, as we do go deeper into the bull market and, you know, all of us, I guess, content guys across the crypto ecosystem, um, you know, most most of us are, are ramping up our content in, in one way or another, right? And it turns out you and I are both doing that as well. So I should just say that, you know, here on the Crypto Conversation, this podcast has been around for, oh gosh, I don't even know, well over a year, probably a year and a half now, coming up to two years even, I think coming up to two years. And we've, you know, we're going to up the publishing schedule of the podcast a little bit, probably aim for, you know, we've been doing one episode a week and probably going to increase that to at least two to three episodes a week. So I do want to make the listeners aware of that. Mostly the format will stay the same, but I'll have people like you on a, a little, little bit more, maybe do some shorter form uh, narrative commentary style pieces as well. But I know you as well are doing a, a lot more video content now for BNC, and I know people do get a, a lot of value out of that. So just tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. Yeah, so we are doing, I'm doing three videos a day and no written articles, which, <laughs> so when I started at BNC, I was basically scouted out, found because of my YouTube channel, which still exists, my personal one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Fran was like, hey, can you do some writing? I'm like, okay. And he's like, oh, by the way, can you do some fundamental analysis too? I'm like, yeah, okay. Because I'm mainly a technical guy. Um, so really most of my fundamental style analysis of, arose because of uh, BNC, which is great. I mean, it made me a more well-rounded trader and just understanding of things better. Um, most people don't care enough about fundamentals to even like bother looking at them. So uh, there's that part of it. And then there's like, you know, people can only consume so much content uh, written. If it were me, I'd, I'd prefer podcasts and visual mediums anyway. So uh, yeah, we're just we're just pumping it out. People are asking for more, and that's part of what, why we're doing it in the first place. That is right. So, of course, listeners, if you're listening to the crypto conversation, you're probably all too aware aware of what we do at BraveNewCoin.com. But of course, all the content is there, and you'll find uh, all of Josh's videos, everything from you know Bitcoin and ETH analysis to all the altcoin analysis videos the DeFi analysis videos and a lot of uh, trading trading tips how to use various indicators and trading tools as well right Josh yeah I just try to uh, so I learned a lot of people ask me about this too you know do you have a course or do you do any like coaching one-on-one -on -one? I, I don't I don't really prefer to do any of that because it's just most of it you know for me I learned for free on YouTube. <laughs> and yeah. then it's just some like, you know, Googling basically. It takes it takes a little bit of initiative to like get started and and I can under understand wanting to like talk to somebody about um, things you don't understand to learn more about uh, certainly. But, um, you know, I do, we do tons of educational content on BNC. So for me, like that's where I would point people if they're always asking for, um, 
for what to, what to, you know, I'm, how do I understand this? How do I understand that? What's that indicator? You know, how do I better understand how to trade the cloud, for example, stuff like that. Um, that, that sort of thing, you just, you need to do it yourself and you need to like learn it yourself, I think. Um, That's right. And look, you know, of course, another option if, if people are, you know, into crypto enough to uh, know a little bit about what is happening, but maybe for one reason or another, they aren't necessarily a, a confident trader because, you know, let's be honest, most people aren't and trading doesn't suit every individual's uh personality type shall we say but of course I, I wonder if we should just talk about your uh, I had some notes here about your um, the holistic ETH BTC portfolio on Enzyme Finance because I have been watching that myself and you know that is I think it's in terms of AUM assets under management that's uh, you're about third on the leaderboard there and you've only been going what a month or so yeah, it's at five hundred fourteen thousand at the moment. That'll uh, move up or up and down relative to the value of the coins. Yeah, I think it's been about a month. Um, yeah, we've been doing this uh, on-chain portfolio management stuff for a little while now. In various mediums. The current solution is Enzyme because it's relatively cheap to transact, even in ETH's expensive environment. And I like it as a trader because it shows people where my trades are, what I'm doing, and there's proof of it. Um, I've always liked any any sort of um, proof of trading type system because social media is rife with what we call LARPers, live action role players who <laughs> yes. perfectly perfectly buy the bottoms all the top every time. And um, they, uh, you know, they're out to, gri they're grifters basically. They're out to uh, sell you courses and things like that. Not to say that anyone who sells you a course is a grifter, but at least for me, this is proof of this is what I'm doing. This is when I did it. It's on chain. You know, there's provenance to it. There's proof of activity, whatever, however you want to think of that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I love the idea. I love that it's, it works. Um, there's some smart contract risk as far as the attack, the attack surface. Um, but that's with anything on ETH overall though. Um, I think it's a great tool for people who either want to copy trade people like me or just want to see what other people are doing and, or, you know, you could even contra trade me or invert trade me um, opposite trade. So if, if you don't like me or my analysis, for example, you could just say, you know, he's long, I'm going to be short. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, that's, I, I like that idea too. It's not like a direct uh, option on, on enzyme, but you can do that indirectly for sure. Yeah, and I, I agree. It's just it's just a, a whole new world, and and it's you know so transparent. You can see what you're up to. You can see what some of the other traders on these kind of platforms are doing as well. And yeah, you're exactly right. It's like a non-custodial on-chain copy trading, and it's hard not to see stuff like this as as really the future of investing. I reckon. But um, anyway, enough about that. If you are interested, you can find out more about that at uh, tickme.capital and uh, or just go direct to enzyme.finance. But um, I just let's bring it back to Bitcoin, Josh. So uh, it, when we were still in the correction, you know, I had had some notes about this uh, parabola, right? So is it parabola or parabola? Let's go with parabola. But um, yeah, so you know, there was this concern that we were going to break this parabola, which, and if you, you break one, then they tend to correct really, really hard. So yeah, interested in your thoughts on, on sort of where we're at. Are we really on, on this kind of steep parabola trajectory and how long can that be sustained? Can there be a double pump? Can we have another one in this bull market? What do you think? Yeah, so if you look at... Um... 2016, 2017, 2018. I mean, that's a prime example, prime example of a parabolic up move. Um, classically, like I mentioned earlier, you get all-time highs, they pull back, usually to the previous all-time high, then and there's a decision made, does it go higher or not? Is there interest? Are there buyers on the sidelines? Um, and that just can happen over and over and over. We saw that um, one, two, three, four, five, six, the seventh time was the top, but this can happen over and over and over and over again. And all the while we're, we're mean reverting, we're resetting divergences, we're doing all sorts of technical stuff, um, 
aside from just like the top people who bought in are panicking because they don't know how to trade and they, they dump everything, they lose all their money, you know, stuff like that. Um, so is this sustainable? Yes, but the market appetite has to be extreme um, for this sort of activity. There has to be, there's usually a fundamental macro driver, whether it be people exiting traditional finance, people looking for some alternative investment, people looking for a store of value. Um, we have the US stimulus likely getting passed soon here. If the denominator is getting multiplied by a hundred million fold or whatever the, the, the uh, stimulus is, then the numerator should go up, right? That, that's just how I see it, but anyway. Uh, this is just basic supply demand stuff. So there's, there's all sorts of stuff going on here. BTC is clearly having a moment. Um, we're seeing new people get in all over the place. And it's these are the people who aren't day trading. They, they don't care what the price is. They just want to enter the market. And that is a very different type of uh, entity than people who are day trading, um, you know, the lows and selling the highs. These are people who are corporations who are just they want 1% on their balance sheet or they want 5%, um, whatever the case may be, to them, the price is irrelevant really. And yeah, it's great that they make money, but um, I think for some of these people in these corporations, they just wanna secure a hedge against inflation or whatever it is, whatever their, their reasoning. Um, Sailor being an extreme example of MicroStrategy who's just like all in mania buying BTC as much as he can. but that's one end of the spectrum. The other end is just people who are just buying 1% of whatever, 1% of your personal portfolio, 1% of your corporate treasury. You know, those are the people that are buying here. Yeah. Well, and it's funny how, you know, last week when, when Bitcoin was above 50 K us and there were some signs of let's say euphoria, right? You know, and and people were talking about potential top signals, for example, the the Twitter laser eyes. Um, your mate Brian uh, and and Kobe had a podcast called Up Only, which was um, a lot of fun, but slightly silly as well. And you know, and and hindsight, some people were calling these things uh, top signals. And of course, you know, we did have a, a subsequent correction. But but now suddenly, the market has cooled down. And just on cue, there's this uh, new wave of really bullish uh, news stories. If you like, for example, Goldman Sachs have said that they're they're restarting their their crypto desk due to demand. You would have seen, did you see the, the report published overnight by Citibank that was extremely, um, I wouldn't say bullish, but well, no, I probably would say bullish. It was very bullish on Bitcoin. And of course, we had the Canadian ETF announced a week or so ago and monthly exchange volume in February apparently hit uh, 1 trillion. So, you know, obviously huge momentum here, Josh. Yeah, there's there's almost an unsatiable appetite for stuff like this. And even like I already said, alternative investing of any kind, whether it be random collectibles, whether it be NFTs, yes. um, we have people who don't know anything about blockchain, don't know anything about BTC, who are getting into the NBA Top Shot stuff, uh, NFT, you know, that those are the kinds of things that are good at bringing people into the fold as far as increasing awareness because they're not going to, you know, most people in general aren't going to go to go and seek out certain things um, that are just out of their wheelhouse or that, you know, they just don't understand. But when we have things like the top shot thing, which we have professional basketball players talking about it, we have Gary V who's a popular, um, I don't even know what to call him. He's oh, got God, a social a, media mogul, I guess. He, I don't know. <laughs> he is so annoying. <laughs> Uh, I find Gary you know, very annoying and hard to listen to. Yeah. I loved him when he worked at Wine Library. So people who, yeah. don't, who don't know who this guy is, um, he is like a New Jersey um, native-ish and he, his family are immigrants and they opened this, this uh, wine shop called Wine Library. He used to do these videos where he would like talk about wines in an approachable way. Anyway, so that's how, that's how I knew him. And then he like blew up into the social media guy and this like uh, coach, um, but he he had been talking about like 
eBay garage sale type uh, flipping for, for quite some time. And he'd always sort of been into collectibles and um, he's been talking about NFTs more and more. We talked about Mark Cuban, I think already talking about DeFi and NFTs. So it's, it's the rich, it's the poor, it's the young, it's the old, it's, it's everybody from all spectrums are, are getting in. And that's the kind of thing you need to sustain prices like this for sure. Yeah, that, that that's exactly right. Okay, well, closing thoughts on on Bitcoin then. Um, yeah, bull market bull market just continues in the meantime. Any anything that you are concerned about? Yeah, I think bringing it back to just basic supply demand. You know, everything I just mentioned was just a measure of increasing demand. If we look at um, the Canadian ETF increasing demand, if we look at Citibank's uh, comments, if we look at Goldman Sachs, uh, all that is demand. And we can look at Google Trends that measures demand. We can look at GBTC um, premium or lack thereof as a measure of demand. Um, we can look at supply, which is coins on the exchanges continue to dwindle. Uh, BTC, ETH, and LINK all are seeing measurable declines and on 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 exchange uh, reserves which historically has been bullish so are the highs right now a little crazy still yeah but it's not like we're seeing like massive warning bells ringing everywhere at least i'm not um i'm not seeing euphoria just yet um btc and eth I'm, i feel like i'm seeing euphoria in nfts where certain individuals are just minting <laughs> minting the stupidest stuff ever let's be honest and just yeah. r- making millions off of it um that that feels a little like bubbly frothy to me um but as far as btc and ether are concerned i think they'll be okay i think also will be okay um march seasonality is quite poor for btc so i expect everything to do much better through q2 and everything through March to just kind of consolidate sideways. Uh, not Nothing too exciting through March, I don't think. Yeah, interesting. To, to me, it, it kind of feels like there's this tension between, you know, some, I guess, you know, TA guys who just see Bitcoin as kind of having hit an all-time high of, you know, 58, 59K, whatever it was, and they don't see how it can keep pushing above that and then you've got you know i guess stock to flow type guys who just see the bull market as just going on and on for at least uh the rest of this year right and you know 100k and beyond but any thoughts yeah, I mean, we usually see 30 percent pullbacks in bull markets and we've seen two already since january um so you know this is what happens when you go up as fast as you do, you get violent pullbacks and then the market decides, you know, are there enough people to, to buy here? Are, are there enough dollars to buy the minor outflows, for example, which is another supply demand thing. If, if miners are selling more than the market can absorb, then price goes down. Um, you know, that's another like, just like stupid, simple thing where, if you're watching that and you see minor outflows continue to increase, 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 then I'd be much more concerned. Now they, they have been increasing recently, but overall I'm not like, it doesn't look super concerning because we're not seeing just, just continued selling. I mean, when you, when you see the selling we saw in uh, February 23rd, for example, <clears throat> where we, we get that low on the 22nd, that gets bought up real quick. And then we get another newer low on the 23rd. <laughs> that feels like somebody's definitely just sitting on the price. Um, and, and people love to do that. I don't know why, but uh, it always feels like it's it's a couple of people just like sitting on the short side, just selling, selling, selling. Um, that seems to have been abated at the moment. Um, obviously we're up 15% from the bottom now. So well, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not concerned. Well, shout out Michael Saylor, who <laughs> at least keeps buying the dip like an I mean, absolute champ. And Somebody's uh, buying here, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, let's just finish this off. I, I did want to just talk about ETH 
Uh, so we talked at the start about how, you know, ETH has not, has been held back, if you like, you know, due to uh, the formidably high transaction fees. Um, but also, you know, did you see any thoughts on the CME ETH futures launch? So that launched a, a little uh, just uh, in, in mid-February, I think, um, and sort of appeared to, you know, boost. That was around when ETH did start to tick up to around 2K and has since pulled back. Even ETH BTC, you know, when does ETH BTC find a bottom, if, if ever? And do you expect ETH to eventually outperform if, if the bull market continues? Yeah, so the seasonality for ETH historically is uh, it does well in Q1 and Q2, and then it does poorly or worse than BTC in <clears throat> Q3 and Q4. So there's that. Um, the CME ETH stuff, a lot of us basically said what we expected for the BTC futures launch, which was it was like peak at the top of, of ETH. Uh, it's sort of like a buy the rumor, sell the news situation. Um, and there were a lot of people saying, you know, it's not going to happen again. It's different this time. ETH is ETH was at all time highs. It was barely in price discovery, I think, at the time. Um, and since the launch, <laughs> it's it's been uh, quite a slaughter for ETH. Yes. It definitely, you know, it's been up and down, but it's definitely more down since the launch. It's still early, you know, blah blah blah. But uh, it's pretty clear what's happened since the launch there. Um, and as far as the ETH BTC, I think there's plenty of like rotation leading lagging trades between um, BTC and ETH. For example, today I can see people rotating into BTC into ETH from BTC because BTC has been more resilient at the lows. Um, so there's some there's some like intra month rotations there, I think. But over the long term, I just think that chart is extremely hard to trade directly. I think it's more of a momentary, um, you know, if if we get EIP 1559, which is a monetary policy thing for ETH, um, will that be bullish versus BTC? If we get this um, gas futures token that, he, that Vitalik is saying, he wants to get rid of, will that be bullish for BTC or for ETH? Sorry, I keep mixing, mixing those two up. Um, so I think it's like a little, it's definitely give and take, a yin and yang thing. Um, but I don't know. I've, I've never been successful at like trading that chart directly. I don't think ETH is going to flip in BTC anytime soon. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so either. I think the uh, the narrative for Bitcoin is just too strong at the moment. And um, yeah, yeah, it's really... Until we have uh, corporate treasuries announcing that they're buying ETH, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against uh, BTC versus ETH because, again, it's just supply demand. <laughs> yeah. BTC's inflation is less than 1.8%. ETH's inflation is around 4%. And you could argue EIP 1559 is going to change that, whatever, that's fine. But um, it's just super, super simple stuff like like that, you know? Yeah. And and when, you know, crypto trading or crypto investing, as they say, is a volatile and a risky endeavor. So even though, you know, some people, they like to make fun of, of the Bitcoiners or Bitcoin as the kind of, you know, the boomer coin of crypto, um, Sometimes that's okay when when Bitcoin is in a bull market. It's it's a very hard uh, investment to beat. And uh, yeah, I think maybe that is a good place to finish, Josh. Um, yeah, so look, shout us out. What have you got coming up on bravenewcoin.com this week? Anything else you've got to share? Let's see on the schedule. I want to talk about BNB, BAT, ZRX. Going to talk about ETH uh, a bunch. Going to talk about a few coins people have been wanting me to talk about. Uh, Band, maybe Nexo, maybe some other super new stuff. Um, yeah, nothing too crazy. I think it's going to be a relatively boring month, hopefully. <laughs> In, right. in the markets, not in the content realm. The content, yes. man, the content's going to be super roaring. exciting. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, a nice a, a month of consolidation, you know, at these levels wouldn't necessarily be a, a bad a bad thing at this point. 
That's right. All right. Always a pleasure, Josh. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll talk again real soon and bye for now. I really hope you did enjoy today's episode. And if you did, please do subscribe to the Crypto Conversation in whatever podcast app you are using. But for now, that is us. We are out of here. See you next time. See you real soon. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave, a new coin.